Since 1907, the picturesque Renaissance Studios on West 57th Street in Midtown, New York, have been the scene of significant artistic activity. Well-known artists have lived and worked in these spacious studios with a grand northern exposure, including Child Hassam, Irving Wiles, James Carroll Beckwith, Charles Baskerville, and others. Today, artists come from all over the world to study at the Portrait Institute, which occupies the former Carol Beckwith residence on the 11th and 12th floors. In this stately room, where Beckwith was host to his friends John Singer Sargent, William Merritt Chase, and others, Today, the Portrait Institute offers a year-round program of master classes, seminars, and demonstrations. One of the best learning exercises for an artist is to make copies of the work of other artists whom he or she admires. Sargent traveled to Spain to copy the work of Velazquez and to Amsterdam to copy Franz Hals. Continuing in this tradition, I'll paint for you a study of one of John Singer Sargent's greatest paintings. No, I don't claim that my abbreviated study will be an exact replica of the great masterpiece. You'd need Sargent himself for that. But we can learn many lessons about color, edges, tonal values, and brushwork. After you have watched this program, I urge you to do the same. John Sargent was the greatest of modern portrait painters. His dazzling bravura style has captivated artists and public alike. His innovative concepts, plus his insights into human nature, make his portraits powerful and unforgettable. An American citizen, Sargent was born in Europe and lived his entire life abroad. An account of Sargent's technical methods is included in the famous 1927 biography by Evan Charteris. Sargent's five basic principles for painting could be summarized as directness. He aimed at once for the true tones and colors. His method was thoroughly a la prima. Economy of means. He preached economy of effort in every way, the sharpest self-control, the fewest strokes possible to express a fact. Accuracy of value. He strove for absolute precision in the judging of the darkness or lightness of each tone. Careful attention to transitions. The flow of one tone or color into the adjoining one is highly significant. The treatment of edges, whether sharp or soft, is of paramount importance everything based on observation. The artist must develop acutely the critical power to see with accuracy and with analytical discernment. Let's proceed now to learn painting lessons from Sargent. I'm going to paint uh, Sargent's Lady Agnew for you in two sections. I have a drawing made on a uh, canvas that measures 36 by 48, which is almost the size of the original painting. But we're going to concentrate first on the painting of the head, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll paint the rest of the canvas for you.
we've studied Sargent's uh, painting style as best we could, and we've determined that he generally started in the traditional oil painting way of beginning with the shadow tones on the side away from the light. In this case, the light is falling from somewhere upper left onto her forehead. And so the first thing we're going to look for in this painting is those places on her face that are blocked off from the main light and therefore cast shadows. For example, I'm going to start with the most obvious one, which is the cast shadow just inside the eye socket. And I'm going to use a mixture of burnt sienna and viridian. And we'll start right there, placing that dark. Since I'm working on a uh, untoned canvas, as I suspect that Sargent did, some of these shadow tones are going to look darker than they will when the uh, supporting half tones are in place. That mixture of burnt sienna, viridian, and I've added just a little touch of white as we start down the nose. Further down, I'm going to add a touch of Venetian red to the shadow mixture. And I'm going to neutralize it with a bit of neutral gray. And I'm going to lighten the tone ever so slightly as I come down here around the uh, shape of the lower nostril. But then as I get to the base of the nose, I can see that the shadow tone gets uh, sharply darker. And so we're going to add a little bit more of our base color of burnt sienna and uh, viridian. All right, so that gives us in a very rough, direct way the shadow tone on the uh, side of the nose. But let's go ahead. We have other major shadow planes on this side of the face. So let's mix a tone here that will give us uh, a usable shadow that we can use all the way down the side of the face. I'm going to once again use a mixture that I have here, uh, which consists of white, yellow ochre, cadmium red light, and a little touch of chromium green. It gives me a, a flesh tone and a shadow tone, but it is, it is a neutralized shadow tone. And without attempting to be uh, careful or precise, I'm going to just go ahead and um, paint the entire shadow side of the face, uh, sort of in a poster way. almost as if we were uh, blocking in a mannequin or a, uh, a form in which we could, we could see as clearly as possible where the shadow planes are. In, in reality, on a human face and on this beautifully finished painting, it is sometimes hard to see where the light ends and where the shadow begins, which is why in an art studio you very often see the artists uh, squinting their eyes in an attempt to see where the edge between the light and the shade meet. In one case, right along the side of the forehead, the line of de demarcation between the light and the shade is quite definite. And so we can be, we can be fairly assured that that's where the shadow is and that's where the light begins. On the ear, to get that sort of rosy glow, we're going to dip into uh, a little bit of Venetian red. All right. How about the shadow beneath her chin, the cast shadow that the chin, the shape of the chin is casting on her throat? Now, I have to be careful because there's tremendous reflected light coming up from the dress and coming up from her rib cage, and, and this shadow is glowing 
with a warm, reflected light. And in order to get that, I'm going to add a touch of uh, cadmium orange. And I'm going to use my um, mole stick just to steady my hand because I want to be careful to draw the edge of her chin as I paint that tone in. Sargent was so terribly interested and concerned with draftsmanship. He studied drawing as an independent art all his life. And as you look at his paintings, you have the strong impression that uh, his concern with draftsmanship was behind every stroke he made. All right, now that shadow tone, the cast shadow under the chin, and I'm going to leave a fairly sharp demarcation for now. We'll, we'll soften that later. I'm going to lighten that tone just slightly and bring it over to the uh, uh, limit of the neck and the shoulder, the, the trapezius muscle that comes diagonally down here. We'll leave a little dry brush edge on that shadow, and, as you, and, and we'll have to put a transition tone later on. Uh, are there any other shadows on the face? Just two. One is the tiny little uh, crisp cast shadow that the nostril is making on the light side. I'm going to use um, burnt sienna and a little bit of white. And I'm going to try to get that color as it should be right from the start. I've made that shadow a touch bigger than it should be. We'll trim it down when we put the surrounding colors on. Then one other shadow is the little crisp shadow up in, the, in her right eye socket. And I'm going to, it, it glows with a warm, kind of fiery red. So I'm going to use, for the first time, a touch of cadmium red. And all it does is it defines the upper edge of the, of the upper eyelid. And it goes right up against where the eyebrow, where we'll paint the eyebrow a little bit later. I think it needs to be a touch darker. Let me just push that down in tone. All right. Um, we're painting shadows. And we want to. We want to be disciplined and get all of the shadows in. How about that cast shadow on her upper, that the upper lip casts on the lower lip? I'm going to take um, alizarin crimson mixed with just a touch of um, burnt umber. And then I'm going to lighten that mixture just a bit. I have sort of a, uh, a dull wine red color there. I'm going to steady my hand with the mall stick. And I want to indicate, now this is a, the, sh the cast shadow that the upper lip is casting on the lower lip. And maybe while we're at it, while I have that color, I'm going to go back into the burnt umber. And my mixture of, of, of uh, alizarin crimson and burnt umber is an excellent color for going here into the shadow tone of the nostril and just indicating the full darkness of that shadow that the nose casts and that um, begins to come down on the upper lip. All right. We want to get our shadows done, so um, one more. The beautiful kind of a grayish, dull, uh, brownish shadow on the shadow side of this eye. It's going to be an important one to give us the, uh, the beauty and the look of that eye. And I'm using to paint it the same shadow mixture I've been using it on the rest of the face, Venetian red and burnt sienna. But I'm going over here where I have several neutral grays. Now, these neutral grays are very simple. They're mixed from ivory black, uh, white, and there's a little touch of yellow ochre in them just to warm them up. 
And if I take the darker of those neutrals and uh, mix it in with the uh, shadow tone that I've been using elsewhere in the face, I get what I need for the uh, shadow tone that defines the, the fullness of that eye on the shadow side of the face. All right, that's basically the shadow tones on the head. But before we can go ahead, we've got to put the dark tones in the hair. I'm going to take a um, fairly large bristle brush, and I'm going to mix a uh, combination of, it's, the hair is very dark, particularly on the shadow, in the shadow. I'm going to take ivory black and uh, burnt umber. I don't know how to mix any color darker than that. It is just the, absolutely the ultimate dark that I can come up with on my palette. And once again, looking at my subject matter and sort of straining to see the point at which the light and shade meet on this shape. Uh, how I wish we were in the National, Acad National uh, Gallery in Edinburgh, Scotland, where this painting hangs. And we could look and see just exactly where the light and shade meet on this shape. Because I, I have a feeling that Sargent would let us see it in the painting. He, uh, he strove for clarity, even though he also loved a soft edge. So I'm going to assume that that light and shade uh, demarcation will run sort of down there. And everything on this side, everything on the shadow side, I'm going to go ahead and paint with this color. Color comes down beside the forehead, uh, right in front of the ear. And I better do that fairly precisely. I'm still using my large brush, but forcing it down into a, uh, a knife edge so that I can bring that dark color right in front of the ear, and then up, and then using, the, using that brush to define the edge of the ear. And I think since this edge is so important, I'm going to take a sable brush and I want to draw this fairly carefully. This is not one of the strokes you can just uh, slap in, because I want to define her jawline. I want to see, I want to, it's important that I establish that angle of the jaw and where the jawline intersects the vertical of the neck, and then down the edge of the neck and along the shoulder. And then right here, that, it, that tone begins to uh, blur out into the softness of the, of the tone around it. All right, so let's go ahead and fill this in. Ivory black and burnt umber. Now I'm going to, I am going to blend that shadow out into the background in just a few minutes. But in the meantime, we'll just uh, use sort of a dry brush edge to remind us that that is going to be a soft edge later on. That shadow, and I know that Sargent's use of, uh, of black was, uh, was controversial since the, uh, the Impressionists were not using black, and Sargent did. Uh, looking at the reproduction, uh, the, that shadow looks uh, impenetrably dark, just as if there was really nothing there. And uh, whether or not it was or not, we can't say in the absence of the actual original painting. Uh, chances are, in this area, Sargent would have put some reflected light. In any case, I'm going to take a little bit of chromium oxide and mix it into the uh, dark of that tone. 
uh, for one thing, it'll be helpful when we blend it out into the green. All right, so, uh, so there's the painting of, our, of the shadow tones on the face and the hair. Ah, I'm sorry, there's one other, and it's terribly important. Burnt umber, just almost pure burnt umber. And that is the little dark in the, in the deepest recess of this eye socket. Now, in a sense, if we were being doctrinaire, the upper eyelids are casting their own shadows, but let's leave that for a moment. All right, so we've come to the second step of our uh, painting, which is the painting of the halftones. And we want to analyze our subject matter, remembering that the way every painter does, he thinks of the light source falling on his subject. Everything that's blocked by the light source will be in shadow. Everything that is in the light source will be a, a half tone. And even though they're very, very dark, such as in the light side of her hair, it's still not a shadow. It's a half tone. So we think in those terms. Let's start with the half tone in the hair. I'm going to go back to the original mixture of burnt umber and black. I'm going to lighten it just a touch, just a touch so that it will exist over here in the, in the light. And we'll just try to see the silhouette of her hair. Again, we're going to blend it into the background in a moment. So wherever, wherever it will be blended, we'll leave a, a, a dry brush tone for now. That's sort of a, a reminder to the painter to blend that tone later. And we'll just go ahead and fill this in. We're going to ignore, as we do this half tone and the other half tones, we're going to ignore the subtleties and try to state all the tones in the simplest possible way. So we'll bring the dark of her hair down over the ear. Again, make the brush into a, kni a knife edge so that we can draw the shape of the, of, the, of the temple and then where the hair comes just in front of the ear. All right, so that's our, that is our first half tone. And the light areas remaining in the hair are really a highlight. And we're going to do the highlights last, so let's leave that for now. All right, the half tones on the head. I'm going to rinse off the uh, number six cat's tongue brush that I'm working with here, because this will be an important brush in the painting of these half tones. And the artist is always wondering at this point what he should do first. It, there's a daunting, whether he's looking at a, a beautiful old master painting as I am, or whether he's looking at a living model, it's the same problem. Where do I start? And my recommendation is that you start in the area that is the most difficult, which is the shadow side of the lower third of the face immediately around the mouth. Uh, it's a tough area. Might as well start there. Get it out of the way. I have three uh, mixtures of color here which are all the same and with slight variations. And I'll, I just want to tell you about them. These three colors are mixed from white, yellow ochre, cadmium red light. That three-way combination is what makes up these three colors. Uh, each of these have slightly more cadmium red light than the others. The next two mixtures are the same, white, yellow ochre, cadmium red light. In this mixture that I'm pointing to, I've added a touch of chromium oxide just to, to give this same color a slightly olive green cast. And the, the fifth pile here, I've added a touch of chromium oxide and a bit of cadmium orange. These two colors are very helpful in the painting of these transition halftones that I'm going to do now. 
for example. I've, and I've named them just for the sake of convenience. I call this half tone one and that half tone two. I'm going to take some of half tone two right now, and I'm going to compare it with the subject matter. And believe it or not, it's pretty good, but it needs to, two things done to it. It needs to be lightened in tone, and it needs to be grayed down a little bit. I lighten it in tone by using the next lighter tone next to it, and I gray it down by reaching over here to the, um, to the neutral grays. So here's a mixture that may work. Let's try it out. In the, for the lower third of the face, in the area of the mouth, I'm going to come vertically along the edge of the philtrum there. I'm going, to, I'm going to go right down into the lip where the lip is and over to the edge of the shadow. Go right up to the next, to the edge of that shadow, blend it in right at this point. Take some more on the brush and we'll go down here below the area of the mouth and across under that lower lip. And there is a, a fairly usable rendition of that very difficult halftone. Uh, I can see some problems with it already. It needs to go darker right near the nose. I'm going to use my mall stick to make this stroke a little more precise. And we'll blend that just slightly. All right. We can use some of that same transition halftone up here beside the nose, this plane on the nose which moves out into the light. I would like to say I could use it up here in the eye socket, but I can't. I can't. It doesn't work. It's an entirely different kind of a tone up there. So I'm going to take um, alizarin crimson neutralize it with one of my neutral grays. And, and notice I'm using the darker of the three neutral grays. That gives me a, uh, a dull, kind of smoky, a very low intensity, warm reddish tone. And if I, if I mix that just a little bit with the tone that I used in the lower third of the face, I think it becomes a tone that I can use here around the eye. Let's try it. Both uh, on the upper eyelid and in the right below the lower eyelid. If I lighten that tone, just adding a little bit of one of the lighter flesh tones and then graying it down just a bit, I think I can use it here in the eye socket. And then darkening it, adding a little bit of uh, neutral gray, I can come up here onto the uh, forehead. You see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to paint the transition half tones now. I have my, my shadow tones in. These are the transition tones that will lead us from the shadow into the light. And I think it's a good idea to discipline yourself to paint according to a, a program like this, rather than simply uh, bouncing around and painting whatever seems to appeal to you. But let's keep on with the transition half tones. Right along the uh, inside edge of the eye socket is a warm transition half tone. I'm going to even reach for a little bit of cadmium orange and a touch of cadmium red. I'm going to just put a narrow little transition tone right there. It looks to me like I can, if I modify that color just slightly, I can use that under the eye. And I can also use it on the eye over here on the shadow side of the, of the right eye. Now that is a fiery warm glow. Uh, Lady Agnew may not have been pleased with that 
particular tone, but there it is. And whatever else Sargent was, he was a realist. And uh, so let's stick with that, f that fiery color with a bit of cadmium red in it. All right. Now, transition halftones. Let's keep going. The um, Just to the um, side of the eye socket is a cool grayish tone, not quite that dark. Let me lighten that up. And putting that on, I see that if I modify that color just slightly, I can go down here and use it in the uh, philtrum, which is an anatomist term down here on the upper lip. That beautiful little um, indentation on the upper lip. That's the same tone as the transition tone up here on the, on the eye socket. All right, we're moving along. And I would guess that the next most important tone is the transition tone along the cheek. Now, very often in a portrait, this color, other than the color on the lips, is going to be the most intense color in the picture. It, it's, it's very apt in the, in the face, rather, the most intense color in the face. Uh, in any case, I'm going to use a good, strong color here. We might want to tone that down later. It has a little bit of alizarin crimson, and it has a little bit of cadmium red. And we'll just lay that on the cheekbone here and push it up into the shadow. And graying it down just a little bit and lightening it just a little bit will come down the angle of the, of the cheek there and let it blend into the shadow in the lower third of the face. OK. Another transition tone uh, uh, with cadmium orange in it right along the, the uh, bridge of the nose. Another small but important along the edge of the shadow on the lower portion of the nose. And then maybe the time has come to, to uh, jump across the face and put some of these transition tones over here in the, uh, in the light side of the face. Let's do it. Al alongside the nose is a cool, almost olive green tone. It's very grayish. I'm going to need a uh, smaller brush and a warmer color to bring that down the uh, side of the nose all the way on to the nostril. We use that to define the nostril. We'll lighten it just a little bit and even come across the bridge of the nose with it. There's a beautiful highlight that we're going to put on that nose a little bit later on. All right, I'm going to wipe clean my brush off and go over here and try to mix the beautiful warm tone on the light side of the face that defines that cheekbone. Let's see whether a simple mixture of white and uh, cadmium red light will do it. And it needs to be made slightly cooler, and the alizarin crimson will do that. Now, Sargent probably used a color called rose matter for that shade. Uh, it's almost the same as alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson is slightly more uh, intense than rose matter. As I add, uh, I'm adding a little bit of additional alizarin crimson each time I go back to the palette. And it seems to get closer and closer to what Sargent was doing. 
All right. I'm going to take that same color, uh, lighten it, and add some yellow ochre to it, and see whether this will give me the tone that comes across the central third of the face. Looks pretty good. As far as the, the mixture is concerned. Now that's white, yellow ochre, cadmium red light. To carry that on across the central third of the face, I need to gray it down. In other words, make it darker and grayer and a little bit more intense. Let me see. That's not. Let me increase the intensity. About like that, I think. And we'll just use that color to go. And we're going horizontally now across the central third of the face. We'll bring that up and just blend it right under the eye socket. OK. Now, we've got a lot of work to do before we, uh, before we can go into the light tones. And we want to keep our focus on the transition tones. Let's go up onto the forehead. There's a very important, big transition half tone up there that occupies the space between the shadow and the light tone. Uh, it is a very subtle color. I'm going to use one of my neutrals, and I'm going to put a little bit of yellow ochre in it. And I'm going to gray it way down. Uh, there seems to be very little color in that tone in the original painting. Maybe just so it will not look uh, totally foreign to the other colors that we've put on the painting, let's warm that up just a little bit. There. Maybe push it a touch darker. Like that. Let's try that color. It's interesting that Sargent would use a color so grayish on a beautiful human face. But later on, when we get the tones out in the light, we may see the wisdom of this color, about like that. And again, we'll paint it just very simply, sort of the way we would paint a poster. We'll come right down into the eye socket, obscuring where the eyebrow will eventually be, and we'll ever so slightly blend the edge of that. Over here on the light side, this exact same color is occurring, but it has, since it's on the light side, it has to be lighter and uh, slightly less intense. Let's see if we can come up with a color that will work over here. We'll blend with those two colors together. Um, my guess is that what Sargent was doing at this stage is essentially what, what any painter would be doing. He's building up. He's building up a uh, sort of a mosaic of colors that will eventually make up his face. Uh, the colors are so different, and they're, uh, they, ha they really should be mixed separately rather than uh, taking one color and just lightening it. Each mixture really ought to be considered independently. It's certainly better practice that way. All right, we're going to leave that. We're going to leave the tone in the center of the forehead for later, when we start doing the uh, the light tones. But let's go ahead and put that uh, that warm, uh, mysterious color around the eye. I'm not sure why Sargent used such uh, a vivid color there. It's unusual in the painting of an eye. Let's go ahead, though, and, and do it.
I've got uh, a little bit of cadmium orange in the mixture. I'm going to use that color on the what little I see of the eye socket here. And then I'm going to wipe my brush off and take a very deep dark, a touch of um, black and um, burnt umber. And now I'm going to paint that shadow in the that the eye it's it's this dark is partly the dark of the eyelid it's uh, of the eyelashes and it is partly the shadow that they cast burnt umber and uh, ivory black And I'm thinking it not so much as painting the eyelashes at this point as painting a shadow tone. Because I'm going to go ahead now and paint the so-called whites of the eyes, ignoring for a moment the, the iris color. We'll come back with the iris. I'm going to go very, very dark in this corner of the eye. With, I'm using the darkest of my three neutrals in the uh, in the corners of the eye in the light, I'm going to use the middle of my three neutrals. You see, people call that the white of the eye, but it's, a, it's far from white, as we can see in the painting of Lady Agnew. The gray that I'm putting on is way down below the midway point on the value scale. Only the white of the eye on this side is up above the midpoint in the value scale. And I'm saying it that way just to emphasize how dark the so-called whites of the eyes really are. And let's, just to guide us now, let's put a little tone on the iris. Again, we're going we're to fuss over the eyes a little bit later, but we're just trying to get the tones now. I'm mixing black, uh, chromium green, and yellow ochre. And let's use that color to uh, try for the, the, the actual color of the iris themselves. We won't do that carefully. We'll just brush it in. And then we'll very quickly go back and get pure black on the brush and darken the upper third of those irises. Why? The answer is that the eyelashes, the upper eyelid, she has lowered her upper eyelid sufficiently to cast a shadow on the pupil. That's the, the function of the upper eyelid. And in so doing, it casts a shadow on the pupil and makes it more comfortable. Now I'm going to take a, a touch of pure black approximately where the pupil will be. But let's not get bogged down in that detail because we have other transition halftones. Let's go on down to the lower third of the face. I'm going to clean my brush off one more time. I'm going to take a, I want to do a, a, a tone on the uh, lower third of the face in the light. It's a very subtle tone. Uh, it has a, a pinkish cast, and yet it is, it is uh, neutralized. So that suggests a mixture of alizarin crimson with our light flesh tone and then neutralized so that it'll be grayish. You see, it's nowhere near as intense as the uh, tone further up the face. And if I can, I have to get the feeling that this plane is going down away from the light. Now, the young lady would be very surprised were she here to hear us talking about all of these color changes on her face. 
she would think her whole face was the same color. But of course, we're seeing literally hundreds of slight variations. And when we get down onto the chin, the chin, like the cheek areas, glows with a, a warm kind of pinkish glow. And alizarin crimson is best for that. We're almost, we're almost finished with the transition half tones. And uh, it'll be time to shift gears out into the lights. But my recommendation to you is that you discipline yourself to concentrate on things in a, uh, in a logical way. The darks first, then the transition half tones, and then the light tones. All right, we have, we have three more important transition half tones. One is the, the so-called key, keystone wedge between the eyes. That is always a tough one to paint. It's almost as tough as the side of the mouth. It's, it's the forehead comes down, and then when it meets the, uh, the brow ridge, it turns under and goes over toward the nose. So we're looking at a plane that is turned down, away from the light. It gets slightly darker and slightly grayer than the forehead above it will be. So I'm going to use a tone similar to the grayish tone we put on the side of the forehead. I'm going to use that for the key, keystone wedge. And we reserve the right, of course, to amend that later after we get the light tones on by darkening that just a little bit, I can go over here and put this tone in the eye socket, the fullness of the eye in the eye socket. And I, I don't see any reason why I can't come down with that tone there. The next important one, and it's a biggie, the uh, transition tone coming down out of the cast shadow beneath the, the chin. Now, it looks to have, to me, to have some yellow ochre in it. It's grayed way down. And I think that a person seeing this color separate from a painting would never dream that it would appear on the human face. But there it is. It's sort of a grayed, yellowish tone that leads that shadow tone out into the light. And I'm going to follow the shape of the shadow and over the trapezius muscle and out along the edge of the, the uh, contour of the shoulder itself. OK. And then that, that interesting, unusual color comes up along the angle of the jaw. And it, it, it's, it's the means by which we can draw, the means by which Sargent was able to draw for us the shape of her jaw. All right, we've got only two tones left. And then we're going to shift gears into the lights. Those two tones are both over here on her ear. Let's put a warm, look how that ear glows with a fiery red, uh, almost pure cadmium red up there in that ear. In fact, I would say it is pure cadmium red. Let's go with just great intensity in there. It's the warm cartilage of the ear. Maybe she's slightly, you know the expression, your ear is burning? She's embarrassed about having her portrait painting painted. And her ears are just glowing with brilliant color. Same thing on this side. It's, the, it's, of course, the blood just below the cartilage, in the cartilage of the ear. And then where it comes down into the light, it's a, the most dramatic possible change. The color changes into a, 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 a pale, almost colorless pink. So I'm going to take alizarin crimson and white 
for one of the lightest tones on the face. Look, it's almost, it is almost as light. I'm going to put just a touch of it right there. There's a lizard, crimson, and white. And it matches, incredibly, the lightest light over here. And since we have it on the brush, let's go ahead and put it there in the groove of her right cheek. The groove is that depression right between the cheek and the nose. And it, it is very often moist in reality, and it reflects the light just vividly as a rule. Well, I said there was, those were all the, the transition halftones, but there's a terribly important one. Let me do it in, on the shadow side of the chin. Uh, and this has to carry all the way through to the finish of the painting. So let me do it, let me do it thoughtfully. Um, it's a fairly light tone. The fullness of her cheek is catching the light right, right there. And then it curves along the angle of the jaw and immediately gets very much darker and very much warmer. And if we just soften the edge of that, uh, and while that's on the brush, we can define the edge of the nostril there. That tone is too light, I'm sorry. I'll have to smear that in just a little bit. All right, we've, we've established our dark tones. We've done our, our transition half tones. What we ne have to do now quickly and, and directly are the light tones, the tones that are on the planes, the planes that are like the forehead that are turned most at right angles to the light source. These are going to be the, the cleanest colors, for one thing. It's important that the brush be, be clean that the pigments be clean. For example, let's do that big tone in the middle of the forehead. Now, this is not the, the absolute highlight. This is the light tone that covers that forehead. I'm going to use our basic mixture of white, yellow ochre, cadmium red light, and I'm going to gray it down with a little bit of neutral gray. Uh, it is a, a beautiful, high-key, uh, fair, very simple flesh color. I think I'm going to add a touch of gray to that and a, just a touch of alizarin crimson. The, uh, the advantage of alizarin crimson in these light tones is that it cools them down and, and keeps it from being uh, orangey the way cadmium, a cadmium red addition would be. All right, here we go. I'm just going to paint that color all the way across the forehead. I'm going to try to put as much color on as I can. I'm going to build up the, the uh, impasto of the color to a degree, except where I approach the half tone. And then I'm going to... Uh, thin it out ever so slightly. I'm going to blend that down into the keystone wedge. I'm going to blend it with my finger up into the transition half tone. And I'm going to blend it over into that half tone. And I'm going to, once again, I'm going to save the highlights for the very last part of this step. All right, going slightly darker, but with that same type of color, I'm going to go down here into the eye socket. I'm going to take a, uh, a small brush and my mall stick to steady my hand. 
and I'm going to put in these light tones right around the eye. They are little uh, reflecting tones. There's a bit of moisture in the skin around the eye there, and they're little points of glistening. And they're basically white, yellow ochre, cadmium red light. And uh, right in the middle of the lower eyelid is an interesting color. It's slightly darker than the other colors in the eye there. OK, but let's keep going on down. Um, on the upper lip, there is a uh, very light struck plane just above where the upper lip is going to be. Where the, the red portion of the upper lip, just above that, is a tone very much like the tone up on the forehead. And then immediately above that is a grayish plane. I have to be careful because if I go too dark, it will have a, uh, a masculine quality. And if I go too light, it will, I, I will miss the fact that it's a plane going down away from the light. And then in the corner right below the nostril is a bright light struck triangle, uh, which looks to me approximately like that, maybe not quite that strong. Let me tone that down. I'm graying that and darkening what I did originally. And then that comes over under the nostril. Now, I'm deliberately leaving some things unblended. Uh, just in the nature of wet oil paint, of course, it tends to blend with what it's placed alongside. But at the, in these early stages of laying the head in, many of the strokes are best left um, unblended. All right, we're kind of dancing around um, the uh, eyebrows and the mouth. And maybe the time has come to put both of those in. Uh, let's do the eyebrow now, at least a preliminary statement of it. I'm going to use ivory black and uh, lightened just a bit with flesh color. We look carefully to see the angle. And even though there's a, a, a multitude of little subtleties in there, we want to make our statement fairly simply. We'll darken it as it goes over into the shadow. All right, same thing over here in the light. Uh, thinking strongly of the direction this stroke goes and then it makes a corner and heads boldly over here. They're, they're good, rich, dark brows. We'll blend that later. Uh, I think we will leave the tones on the mouth because we want to get the transition tone down that neck. I think it's important that we do that. It's more important than the mouth at this stage. The neck is a cylinder that goes down away from the light, most, which means that most of the tones are going to be grayish. And the further they are away from us, around the cylinder of the neck, the grayer, the, the grayer they will be. So I'm adding some neutral gray to it. It's a very pale color. You can hardly see it against the tone of the background. And we'll use that to, to draw the shape of the, of the clavicle that we can see, the clavicle bone just below the surface. And then our last light, major light tone is in the center of the neck, between the 
the um, between the chin and the transition half tone. It's a very light tone, lighter really than anything on the face except the highlight on the forehead. Okay, we're at a, an important point in the painting of the head. We've laid in our darks, we've laid in our half tones, we've laid in our light tones. We have essentially the mosaic of the head. Now the time has come to begin to particularize it, paying attention to the eyes and the nose and the mouth. But before we can do that, we have to take a few moments and to go back over everything that we've done and restating. It means looking in at what we've done and sort of fixing things, going a little darker here, a little lighter here, a little softer here, a little more definite there. Uh, it's an important step in the painting, and uh, it shouldn't be hurried over too quickly. Let me show you what I mean. The um, best way to do it is to simply go back over what you've done, starting at the point where you started. Now, uh, in the beginning of this painting, we started on the shadow side of the face. So let's do our restating in that same order. Looking at, at my shadow tone and comparing it to the original, it occurs to me that uh, I need to go slightly darker and slightly warmer in the area of the cheekbone. It's just a touch, but it's awfully important. Right here in the area of the cheekbone, I've added a little bit more uh, burnt sienna and the tone is slightly darker than what I had before. I'm going to blend the edge. Then coming down the sh that shadow, I'm going to try to find the original mixture here on the palette. And I'm going to use my mall stick because I want to be a touch more precise about the shape of her jawline. Bring that color down, a little bit uh, more color on the canvas now. And down the neck and down the angle of the shoulder. And blending that. Then thinking of the original order in which we uh, painted these things, let me go up onto the shadow side of the forehead. I may not even need the brush. I'll just pull a little bit of dark color from the hair down into that shadow, making it darker just pulling a little color from the hair. It'll help me to it'll help me to uh, soften the edge. As, as well as make that shadow darker. And I'll make the transition over into the eye socket a little softer. And I can soften that edge a little bit. All right. Uh, remembering the, that we went from there to the transition tone beside the nose, I can see two things wrong with it. One is it needs to be lighter and warmer. So I'm going to use a tone right here that is not so dark as what I painted originally and warmer in color. It makes that shadow tone not quite so heavy beside the nose. I'll bring that down and shape the nostril a little more carefully. And we'll make our transition out into the light tone a little bit better. All right. 
restating the half to the uh, dark half tone, comparatively dark half tone, beneath where the lower lip will be. Let's go a touch more definite there. And we'll sort of feather the lower edge of that. All right. Uh, the shadow tone beneath the chin seems fine, but how about that beautiful glowing reflected light on the underside of her jawline? Now that is a beautiful passage. I'm going to use cadmium orange and white. It's reflected. It's reflecting up from her rib cage, where, on which the light is falling, and I'm going to use cadmium orange and white for that. I don't want to overdo that. The temptation is to make that more powerful than, than it should be, but I don't want to make it, I don't want to miss the chance for something very dramatic there as well. Reflected light is always a, a pleasure to paint, and it, there is always a, a temptation to overdo it. But it goes up the jawline sort of like that. And the transition over into the light on the chin is very subtle, more subtle than what I have here in the painting. So that's what I mean by restating. And my job is to go over the entire face looking for areas in which a, just a slight adjustment is going to be beneficial just before I begin to paint the features. For example, this half tone on the side of the nose was too dark and just too heavy in the original painting, in my original painting, and I'm lightening it just a, tough, a touch. The, um, the restating step in any painting uh, is one of the most important steps and one that you shouldn't hurry. All right, now we're going to focus our attention in, on each of the features, starting with the eyes. And so let's take just a moment before we actually begin to delineate the eyes and let's see if we can correct these uh, tones. First of all, that warm tone that we put on the upper eyelid. Let's, let's make a few changes. In the, in the eye on the light side, let's go darker. I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use a bit of uh, burnt sienna and alizarin crimson to go darker on that side of that eye. I'm going to take some of that same color and go into the shadow on this side and down the eyelid. I'm going to uh, lighten that color and emphasize the shape of the eyelid on this side, and even push some of that color out to the limit of the uh, eye socket, and we'll just soften that edge. Let's add a little bit more intensity as we, as we go into the tear duct and right below it. And again, that uh, extremely warm color is not necessarily characteristic of eyes, but it certainly is there in this very beautiful painting. So we're going to stick with, uh, with what we see there. OK, now let's begin to look at the detail in, in the eye. Let me once again take the color of the 
iris itself. Those are uh, hazel eyes. I'm going to use chromium oxide and a little bit of uh, burnt sienna. And I'm going to restate. I'm going to add a little bit more burnt sienna to what I had before. And I'm going to restate the iris color. And I'm also in the process making the iris, the part that's in the light, making it slightly darker. All right, I'm going to lay that brush down and take a tiny little flat sable. And I'm going to go back into my mixture of ivory black and burnt umber. And let's pay a close attention now to the shape of the of the upper eyelid as it curves over the eye. Comes around, it's almost, appears to be almost pure black. And over here on the shadow side, I would recommend pure black. I cannot see that Sargent introduced any color into that extreme dark. If he did, it's not, it's not clear in the reproduction that I'm looking at. And we come right down into the corner of that eye, and I'm going to make the, the shadow tone there very dark. That is, a, uh, that is a shadow. The eye itself is not that dark. And there's a little bit of that feeling coming down in that eye as well. All right. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to wipe the brush off and take pure ivory black. And the only stroke on the painting I can make without reference to the model herself, or to the original painting in this case, is the pupil. I know that the pupil of the eye is always going to be just simply pure black, pure ivory black. It's the total absence of any light. I can count on that. So that's the way I'm going to paint it. And in this case, since the upper third of the iris is very much in shadow, I'm going to use my ivory black to create that effect. The shadow comes down over uh, essentially the upper third. And he's added, Sargent has added a little bit of dark definition here at the bottom of each of each iris. Now, I'm going to try to find the smallest uh, pointed sable that I have in my collection over here. It's a tiny little, just a tiny little zero, zero brush. And I'm going to take pure permalba white. And I'm going to do the catch lights in the eyes. And looking at the original, I see that the catch light is at what, what an artist would call the 11 o'clock position. And I'm going to put it in just as uh, precisely and minutely as I can. The temptation is to make it too big. It's very petite and precise, 11 o'clock. All right, that's all there is to that. And again, the uh, student is tempted to make those bigger than they should be. All right, I'm going to take my small brush. And the only additional chain, addition I'm going to make to the eye is I'm going to define the edge of the upper eye lid just a touch on that side. and. Uh, it should be on this side. I have to use a, a more reddish tone. I'm going to use burnt sienna. And just define that it, the, where the, it's 
not really a line in nature. It's the point at which the upper eyelid folds back into the eye socket. And the only last touch we could maybe do on the eyes is um, going slightly darker where the lashes come down and overlap the um, lower eyelid. We'll take a bit of burnt umber on our brush and go under the eye, treating the uh, lashes on the lower eyelid in a, in a horizontal way, going around under the eye, rather than painting them as individual lashes. It's important that the that the painter resists the temptation to paint individual eyelashes. All right, let's go ahead on down the uh, nose. We may come back to the eye before we're finished with this painting, but let's go on down the nose. The nose, more than any other part of the face, is essentially a painting of the planes of the nose. Let's take the color with which we painted the shadow. And studying Lady Agnew, let's look to see if we can't refine the shape of that nose a little bit. We'll just draw that edge a little more precisely. We'll draw the shape of the lower part of the nose a little bit more precisely. We'll take a moment to soften the edge. The lady has a very uh, refined and delicate uh, physiognomy, and we don't want to uh, do an injustice to it. The nose has two slanting diagonal underplanes, a plane that goes this way and the plane that goes this way. And I, we see this diagonal plane very clearly because it's in shadow. The plane on this side is a little bit harder to see because it's out in the light, but we'll take a little bit of warm color and uh, draw the underplane of that nostril. All right, if we once again emphasize the placing of the nostril, I'm going to use burnt umber and alizarin crimson. You'll remember. That was the combination I used earlier on. And I'm going to restate the position of that nostril. And then lightening it up and warming it up with Venetian red, I'm going to come uh, around and shape shape that nostril, trying not to be overly definite, but also trying not to, uh, I don't want it to be uh, blurry or wishy-washy. I want it to have a certain precision, but a soft precision. The same thing would be true up there. Now, maybe most important of all on the nose is the painting of the highlights. And Sargent has given us three highlights. One of them is called the catchlight, and that's on the, on the bulbous tip of the nose. And I'm going to use just simply white and uh, alizarin crimson for that. I've left, it, I've left the white of the canvas there until now. Now I'm replacing that with a, uh, a color. And I'm going to lay the brush down and with a uh, just a soft, blurry brush, I'm going to uh, soften the edge of that shadow, uh, of that crisp highlight, soften the edge of that crisp highlight. And while I'm at it, I'll soften the edge of that shadow. OK, taking the uh, brush with the highlight color again, there are two other highlights, one of them easy and one of them hard. The easy one is up here in the brow ridge, and it's very subtle. 
and it's just one brush stroke. And it curves around like that. That's a little strong, and I'm going to soften that in just a moment. But there's another highlight, and it's one of the most interesting strokes in the painting. If you'll study the original, you'll see that there's a crisp, brilliant highlight on the uh, bridge of the nose. And Sargent has struck it in there, and it, it has remained there right on the surface of the painting for 75 years. And it's a puzzler. It's so strong. I'm going to try to do it as strong as Sargent did if I can, if I dare, and it's right there. And I wasn't daring enough. Let me make it slightly wider. It comes over this way. Now I'm going to take that little soft uh, sable brush, and I'm going to ever so slightly knock the edges off of these highlights, particularly the one up here in the brow ridge. Make it just blend in there. And this one, I'm going to soften the bottom edge of it. And the edge on this side. And having done that, I'm going to go back and restate the catch light on the tip of the nose and bring it out a little bit. All right, let's move on down to the uh, details of the mouth. And I'm going to, again, just as we did with the nose, I'm going to think of the mouth as a collection of planes. First of all, the upper lip is a plane turned away from the light, which means it's going to be slightly grayer in color and uh, to a degree darker than the lip below it. So I'm going to use alizarin crimson a touch of uh, Venetian red and white. And let's try that combination, see how it looks. To paint the upper lip, I'm going to come uh, this way for that stroke, for that part of the lip, and I'm going to come this way here. And then I'm going to go over here toward the corner and shape that. Now I have reflected light coming into the lower part of this lip, but I'm going to do that later. Let me just get the shape going. A little bit more of that color, and we come over into the shadow side. And then I'm going to go down and just simply add a little bit of white to it for the uh, reflected light. Now, this is an interesting passage because the, the light is uh, reflecting up from the lower lip onto the upper lip. And we see the demarcation between the lips by virtue of this reflected light. And it comes over and goes all the way to the corner of the mouth. And over here in the shadow area, the, the edge of that lip is, is hard to see. Now we're going to feather that edge in a moment so that it won't be too sharp and precise. But let's go on down. I'm going to reach for pure, almost pure cadmium red to put the upper plane of the lower lip. And I'm going to start. I have to go darker than that. I'm going to add uh, Venetian red, because it, must, it has to contrast with that uh, plane of reflected light. There it is. And I want to look at the, uh, at the uh, shape of that lip. And there's just a small amount of this very intense cadmium red color, just about like that. Then I'm going to wipe the brush off, go back down and get some of my 
alizarin and Venetian red combination. And then we'll use that to paint the light struck plane of this lower lip. Now when we get down to the lower edge, we don't want to be too rigid or precise. We might even sort of, uh, like a child would say, go outside the lines so that it, the lip won't have a, uh, we don't want the lip to have a, uh, a pasted on or painted on look. This was 1892. Um, I don't know enough about such things to know whether this lady was wearing lipstick or not. I suspect she probably was. Some of it may have been just the natural, healthy color of her lips. Now, I have to think in terms of the planes of that lower lip. First of all, remembering that this is the shadow side and the, plane, the side plane of the lip on the shadow side is going to be darker, and that is what will define the shape of that lower lip. There is an underplane of the lower lip that goes down this way, and it actually disappears into a tiny little area of shadow that I have not painted yet. Right there, there's a, just a tiny, crisp little shadow area. Now, I'm going to go take that slightly blurry brush that I used to uh, soften the highlights in the nose, and I'm just going to knock the edge off of this uh, color so that it won't be a um, It won't be a knife edge where, where the upper edge of the lip meets the unpigmented area. Let me just, just to cut the sharpness off of that. Now going back to uh, the brush with which I've painted this, let me do my highlights. It's white and alizarin crimson and uh, I want to be careful about the mixture because if it's too light, it will have a false look, and if it's too, if it's not light enough, it will not have the moist look that it should have. So we may have to make a couple of adjustments here. Here's one highlight right here. Now that's too light. You see, it has a slightly jarring slightly false look. Let me go back and state that it's just a touch darker if I can. You have to kind of have a shot at it though, like I did, and then adjust it down. That's better. That's better. And with some of that same kind of color, let's do the other one. All right, now it's important that I go back and restate that cast shadow. This we painted an hour ago, and it's gotten pushed around a little bit. I'm going back to alizarin crimson and burnt umber, and this is what shapes the shadow side of that upper lip. That goes all the way into the corner of the mouth, and then it it goes, partakes of the cadmium red where it comes toward the center of the mouth. And then where it goes down into the, goes down away from the shadow, I need to get sort of a soft transition area, area, area if I can. All right, uh, the only other thing I think is urgently needed is to clean my brush off and to restate that highlight just above 
the upper lip that we've just painted. Now, right above there, coming, and I'm going to use it as a drawing line to reshape the shape of that lip and to come down into the philtrum just a touch. All right, now we're going to splash a little color onto that background. We really maybe should have done it prior to this, but um, we want to do it mainly that, so that we can blend the edges of Lady Agnew's hair into the background. And so I'm using ivory black and viridian, and into that I've, uh, now that strikes me as a little bit too greenish. Let me, let me just tone that down, and as with anything else, I can tone it down by dipping into one of my uh, neutral grays. That's the great advantage of having those three neutral grays there. All right, I'm going to tone that color down. In fact, I might even uh, wipe off what I just did. And I can go back again, and you can see that that color is now uh, more, a little bit more neutralized. It's not quite so pungently green. But it's quite a dark, uh, it's quite a dark green, nevertheless. We'll bring that right down to the edge of the chair. We'll come right up to the head. And where we get close to the head, I'm going to use a uh, sable brush just so that I can be a little more draftsman-like. I want to go around that curve, curl in her hair and around the uh, fullness at the crown of the head. And we'll, uh, there's that soft edge we've been kneading all along. Then we'll come right up against the side of the head. and right against the ear, and we'll just pull a little bit of that color out into the background, just so that the edge will not be too, we'll come back with a brush in just a moment. All right, let's keep going with that. Let's come, we'll go all the way up to the top of the canvas. And I can see other tones in there, but we'll We'll save those other tones for a, those other colors for another day. In this case, we'll just be very simple. Now, as he comes this way, the background color begins to get uh, slightly lighter, but uh, only as it comes over into this portion. So let's keep going with this. I'm going to stay away from that shadow for just a moment. Because when I get down into the shadow, I want to gray down my color. And I'm going to do that by taking uh, burnt sienna. Rather than adding black, I'm, going to, uh, I'm studying what I see there in the reproduction. And it has a warm quality to it. I'm going to gray the color, not with black, but with with burnt sienna. And obviously, Lady Agnew is sitting there in the light, the natural light of Sargent's London studio. And her, her head is casting a shadow on the drapery background. And right there behind her head, as we noted earlier, it is really dark. I'm amazed at the darkness of that shadow. And then Sargent blends it off into the background tone. It is a very subtle transition from the, um, you cannot see in the, in the reproduction of the painting, you cannot see where the hair ends and the shadow begins. You cannot see it. And that's the way we'll, we'll do it in our painting. That's, a, that's one of Sargent's favorite indoor sports is doing a transition so subtle that you can't see it. And that's one of the beauties 
of a sergeant, of the way that sergeant painted. Now I'm going to take a big sable brush and just make sure that that edge is, is uh, soft. Now the last thing we're going to do on the hair is to go back to the bristle brush with which we painted it uh, a couple of hours ago. And I'm going to restate the edge of her head where it comes against the background so that that will be Sometimes under certain lighting, these very dark strokes uh, take on a shine that make them difficult to see. But that's part of the challenge of oil painting. And there's a delightful little sort of a loose sprig of hair there, and another one right over the ear there. Remember, this was 1892. And then we'll come, there's a, uh, there's a nice strong shadow here on the, just above her forehead. And we can see a touch of a highlight in her hair. And then the hair comes right here over the forehead. And maybe we need to bring that down just a bit, just a touch. And then strongly defining the hair down here just above the ear. And, uh, and then the deep shadow down here. The, the only th last thing we're going to do to this part of the picture is to put a little color on that chair just next to her face. Again, so that we can blend the edge of the face. Uh, I'm going to do the fabric tone of the chair without the pattern on it. The only, I'll do that touch of pattern right next to her ear, but the rest of it will be just a, a neutral tone here. I'm using white and black and a little touch of yellow ochre, and there's the fullness of the, of the uh, cushion of the chair. And we'll let that, the, the pattern define her, her ear in just a moment. I'm going to add a little bit of white as we come down the chair. Because remember, uh, we said a while ago that the tone on her neck was as light as the tone on the chair. In fact, uh, they're almost exactly the same color, the same tone, I mean, where I come right where the chair comes up against the neck. And down in this area, the chair becomes slightly lighter. The edge of her uh, neck is just one tone lighter. No, that's too light. Let me correct that. That's too light. Let me, more like that. Just one tone lighter than her neck. And then uh, slightly darker here to, to define the edge of her jaw. And then let me take, let's see, what brush should I use? I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use a, um, a, uh, a brush that is called a cat's tongue brush. It's a flat sable. And I'm going to take uh, chromium oxide and add to that a little bit of uh, yellow ochre. And I've got to gray that down, so into the neutral gray. Add a little bit of yellow ochre. All right. Here is that color right next to her ear. And I'm just going to take, put in a few strokes of it. This is, this is part of the floral pattern of the chair, which we will paint in the second half of this demonstration. Add a little bit of black to it to come over here under the ear 
and to define the edge of that beautiful jawline and down like that, lighten the color a little bit and we'll just make a few random strokes out into the chair like that. Now that's all that Sargent does there. Then he continues with more floral pattern, which we will do later on. So at that point, I think we'll stop on the head of Lady Agnew and we'll continue with the rest of the painting in the second half of this demonstration. <laughs>